Mm. So, yeah, symmetry. Um, Pia's not wrong. Um, this is a hard topic to talk about a little bit for me. Um, so, I am going to talk about symmetry today. But first, how does that make you feel? <laughs> Are you a bit frustrated? A little bit on edge? Maybe do you wish you hadn't come to this talk already? Well, bear with me. Uh, this talk does align pretty well with how I approach any conversation, so be prepared to jump all over the place with, uh, with very little tie to the theme, roughly, of symmetry um, as well. So a little bit about me. <laughs> I'm Josh Christopher. We talked about Project 202 already. I'm a senior experience director with them. I have two small children, two and four, so I enjoy my family time with them. I do woodworking, like Pia said, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm a design manager with Project 202, so I care pretty passionately about that. UX design, product ownership. Um, my degree and my background is in industrial design, so product design. I went to art school, which you'll also see a little bit of that in this deck, so you are all my people. Um, I'm really into self-deprecating humor. Um, I have tiny hands. <laughs> I enjoy comedy as well, as you'll see. So, I don't know if you know how Creative Mornings talks work. I think Pia talked about that a little bit, but they loosely have this theme of symmetry, which you're supposed to tie to. And well, to be honest, I did struggle to try and land the plane on this quite a bit. And I really wanted to come up with something provocative to say about symmetry. And the last thing I wanted to do was get up here and just simply define symmetry for you all. So after months of work, working on the topic and kind of gating it around in my head, um, what I finally landed on is the definition of symmetry <laughs> is the quality of being made up of exactly similar parts facing each other via reflection or around an axis. And so we're going to do a light recap from art school for those of you who met and for those of you who didn't. But there's a variety of different types of symmetry. There's reflectional symmetry. There's translational symmetry, which is actually something that's a little bit more tied to like a pattern. Right? You can do patterns, and that's a, that's a form of symmetry as well. There's glide reflectional symmetry, which would be something like footprints in the sand. Right, So they're mirrored over an axis, but then shifted as well. And then I think, to Pia's point, maybe why somebody thought of me when it came to the topic of symmetry, there's rotational symmetry. So I do some wood turning. This is a video of me doing some wood turning. If you've ever thrown a pot on a potter's wheel or wood turned with a lathe, the premise is you use a machine to create something that inherently has rotational symmetry. And so, um, I'm not going to get a lot into woodworking today, but if you want to ask me questions about that later, uh, we can, I can gab on that all day long. So symmetry in nature uh, occurs all the time. Uh, there's, in biology, there's radial symmetry. There's uh, another form of, technically, of radial symmetry is the Fibonacci spiral, which is closely tied to the golden ratio that we leverage a lot in design as well. There's this really interesting form of symmetry in biology called the fractal pattern symmetry, where as you continue to zoom in forever and ever on an object, it'll continue to be the same thing over and over again. And I remember that premise of fractal pattern symmetry when we get back into music, because I'm going to come back to that a little bit. Um, and then there's bilateral symmetry, which is the form of reflectional symmetry in biology, which is what we are as human beings. Most of, most of us, we have that uh, bilaterally symmetrical division across us, and actually while it's certainly subjective to an individual, it has been shown to be one of the main parameters we consider when assessing beauty. Although I'll say that's debatable when you look at my left reflectional and right reflectional symmetrical lines in Jojo and Shishif here. And then, <laughs> as I did this, I started to think to myself, is it possible to look too symmetrical <laughs> and too perfect. And, and that really led me to think about uh, the uncanny valley a little bit. Those of you that are familiar with that premise, it's a common unsettling feeling we get when we are, have experience with androids or humanoid robots, both in audio or visual simulations. We get 90% of the way to replicating human beings, and that additional 10% is a huge valley for us to cross, for it to actually be believable rather than creepy. And so, I think maybe some of the things that lend to that are the fact that when we create synthetics, we create completely symmetrical in, uh, beings, and that perfection also sometimes could be something that lends to the fact that we are uneasy about it. 
There was even a study done in 1999 that showed that women can actually smell, uh, via blind smell tests, can smell how bilaterally symmetrical a man is uh, via blind smell tests. And the actual quote from the study that I have is, a study in 1999 showed that the body scent of a man who has greater bio body bilateral symmetry is rated as more attractive by normally ovulating non-pill using women during the period of highest fertility based on the day within their menstrual cycle. And I promised both my female co-workers and my wife I wasn't going to say menstrual cycle in my talk about symmetry yet. Here we are. <laughs> Sorry for all of you. Now we have exceptions about how attractive people are whether or not they're symmetrical or not all the time, so if you're not perfect, <laughs> don't be upset about that. Um, that's okay. Since we're talking about faces, humans love seeing them. We see them everywhere. Even if there's anything that could be perceived as two eyes and a nose, we immediately project a face onto that thing. Uh, that's actually a psychological phenomenon called pareidolia. It's a fun thing to Google and check out, and that's just basically the fact that our brains lend significance to facial features in particular random patterns. And while we're still on the subject of faces, I think this slide deck just needs one more picture of me. <laughs> but the very fact that you all who've never met me before are sitting down there going like, have I met this guy before? He looks just like my cousin, or Little Dicky, or Seth Rogen. Uh, I all the time get recognized for people that I'm not, and so to me I just classify that as doppelganger syndrome and another example of why nature's lazy. <laughs> all right, so like I said, whoa, this is our first jump <laughs> into a different area, but symmetry in math and physics. I thought, you know, what better for a bunch of creatives than to start talking about math and physics. Um, so when I came across this example in my research around symmetry and physics, I really gravitated toward this story and I wanted to share it with you all. So in 1915, Albert Einstein and David Hilbert were having issues with their general theory of relativity. They needed a fresh set of eyes, so they enlisted the assistance of a mathematician named Emmy Neuter. And it was a scandal at the time. Hilbert tried to obtain a position for her at the university that they were at, but was met with resistance. So Emmy and Hilbert just said, screw it. And Emmy began to offer lectures um, under Hilbert's name as his assistant. But at the time, um, Einstein and Hilbert were at this paradox where they were like, so if energy can warp space-time, and space-time contains energy, then space-time should warp space-time. Ah, F this, right? They were at this insane paradox. And then Emmy came in and basically said, dudes, calm down. <laughs> Things are a lot more predictable than that because symmetry, hang on while I math this to death. And she began to come up with a whole lot of uh, things that we now know as Noether's theorem, which lent significance to what ended up being the general theory of relativity. And it, and it had to do with symmetry and movement. So one of the aspects of Noether's theorem is this, uh, this premise of translational invariance. So if a machine or a system operates under a certain set of principles, and I move that machine, and I'm able to replicate its environment, that machine should function in the same way in a new location. Similarly, there's time invariance. If I have a machine and it operates in a certain way, and at any time in the future, if I'm able to replicate its environment, that machine should function in the same way. And then lastly, rotational invariance. If I have a machine and I apply rotation to it and I replicate its environment, that machine should function in the same way. And you can see how this will end up lending itself to you know, planets moving around a star in a solar system, and the continuity and consistency and movement that we lend and we know of as physics. So consistency and movement is essentially what we call symmetry in physics. All right, I'm off of the smarter topics for me, my struggles. There. All right, getting into symmetry in music. So there, remember that uh, fractal pattern symmetry I talked about earlier on? There's this premise in music called a music fractal, and that's where a piece of music, when slowed down or sped up or reversed and played over itself, can actually harmonize with that piece over top of itself. And I've got a really good example of that. Johann Sebastian Bach loved him some symmetry in his fugues, and I'm gonna play one for you real quick. What this represents is just different speeds of the same pattern, either played in reverse with different instruments at different keys, all played over itself, itself and layered over itself as well. This visual was done by the Santa Fe Institute. I think it really illustrates that music rock. 
played in reverse that old Led Zeppelin song, you slow down, you play the record in reverse, and you hear how much you should worship Satan. Uh, <laughs> so it's kind of a shtick, but another way that artists have leveraged the, the idea of symmetry within a context of their music. All right, moving on to symmetry in architecture. Symmetry in architecture is one of the most common ordering principles of architecture. It's used to create a rational order or calm logic. Um, in addition to that, we see it even in some of the oldest bits of architecture, even across cultures, across architectural styles, across time frames. These Moroccan tile patterns we see from Casablanca, they look the same if you shift them to the right or left, as well as if you rotate them in any way. Mm. And they represent detail and precision in architecture as well. Um, symmetry in film. So we often communicate that good storytelling has an arc at which the point of highest conflict and then immediate resolution is reached, so even the way we craft stories has some form of symmetry applied to it. But outside of that, see any movie by Wes Anderson or Stanley Kubrick, you'll see that some very notable filmmakers have uh, what is a discernible style to them that leverages, you guessed it, symmetry. Um, and their attentiveness to place and frame, or mise-en-scene, if that seemed like it was tough for me to do, I was up all night last night, right? <laughs> is viewed as intentional and, and great attention to detail. So illustration and graphic design, symmetry in illustration and graphic design. The latest redesign of the Starbucks logo, the Siren, uh, had quite a few iterations that became way more symmetrical on the left than what they previously had uh, within the Siren. And what, what the designers found, that the, they found that the eyes got more friendly as they started to stray from completely symmetrical features. And, that's when the team realized that despite the fact that we've all been led that about certain things about human attractiveness, no one really liked looking at a perfectly symmetrical illustration of a siren face. It was kind of a eureka moment for that team as well. Um, if you do any kind of digital art, there's some really great uh, apps out there today that allow you to leverage symmetry rulers to create digital art. This one's called Amazeograph. It's a really, really neat example of how to leverage symmetry in illustration. <coughs> There's ambigrams, which are often used for tattooing, but it's a word or art form that's symbolic, a symbolic representation whose elements retain meaning when viewed or interpreted in a different direction. Mm. And that's not to be confused with palindromes, which are words or phrases with the same meaning front or back, like taco cat. <laughs> Symmetry and fine art, this could be an entire talk, uh, so I just cherry-picked a few examples here. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, most of his pieces are often looked at as having a, a grid reapplied to them again um, and having some really nice structure and almost mathematical, um, but he actually leverages symmetry in the example of the Last Supper to help with the storytelling. What's happening on the left versus the right, placement and frame, all have some impact of him trying to create a story out of this still image he painted. In school, if you went to art school, we all learned about the rule of thirds, but some additional detail on a more robust premise is dynamic symmetry. Uh, it's another form of rationalizing or creating structured compositions. Basically, uh, it's accomplished by using, utilizing dynamic rectangles and to grid out a composition. And the one sh shown here is called the root five. Um, so that's a fun thing to leverage if you make art as well and we look at. MC Escher, everything, most of his, his artworks, he was a Dutch graphic artist and he made uh, mathematically inspired illustrations, and so a lot of his stuff have, has symmetry, has pattern, um, some really, really great examples there. Georgia O'Keeffe, um, American painter, um, a lot of her stuff is very floral and organic and beautiful. Uh, many of her works are extreme close-up of fl flowers, and uh, they look an awful lot like uh, the opposite of something phallic, which has a word, and that word is yonic, just don't Google that from your work device. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this premise of uh, creating things that have asymmetrical balance, and that's more difficult to do than just an immediate bisection and a reflection of a thing, and it relies on compositional balance of dissimilar elements to create symmetry in the way that we look and our eyes flow over a piece as well. Um, it's a lot more complex to achieve as well. Symmetry in writing. Um, 
writing generally is one massive form of symmetry. I mean, the fact that in the English language we just repeat our 26 characters over and over again to derive meaning out of them is a form of repetitive symmetry. Um, and symmetry, of course, shows up in writing all the time. But one of my favorite examples of symmetry in writing is parallelism. Uh, so I'll give you an example. An example of a non-parallel phrase is Josh likes Harvey Wood to eat junk food and naps. Um, the parallel version of that is Josh likes carving wood, eating junk, and taking naps. Um, it's often used, parallelism or parallel structure is often used to create clarity, uh, to provide emphasis, to generate rhythm in a phrase or dialogue. Um, and it's leveraged in quite a few of the things that we quote very frequently. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Um, my point is, life is about balance the good and the bad, the highs and the lows, the piña and the colada. <laughs> All right, symmetry and product design. Everybody, I know I'm jumping everywhere. <laughs> so, a lot of the things we make for ourselves, we interact with. And a lot of us, like I said, are bilaterally symmetrical. So oftentimes our products take on that shape too. When we're creating a chair, it makes sense for that chair to be bilaterally symmetrical like we are. Although, Asymmetry in product design often has a tendency to look more complex or organic, despite symmetry showing up all the time, like I said, in nature. So we have to make intentional decisions about symmetry when we design products because oftentimes it's easier to manufacture something that looks more symmetrical, generally, too. Uh, but even outside of that, our current aesthetic um, is really uh, lends itself very well to, um, this is an example of Dieter Rams. Uh, German industrial designer, his un un unobtrusive approach to design and product design is this whole like less is better and we're still referencing it today in quite a few of the products that we create um, and copying it. Now uh, this is an example of uh, asymmetry in product design, it's off the license plate on the Land Rover, it's only been off to the left, the most recent uh, design of the Land Rover is pretty polarizing. You either love this or you hate it. It's very similar to my title slide. It's, oh man, it's so close to the center, and so they get a lot of <laughs> flack about that as well. So asymmetry in products that can often be polarizing as well. All right, lastly, symmetry in what, uh, what Project 202 and what we do, symmetry in UX design. Today, we are creating experiences with uh, design systems. So we are creating components that are meant to be reutilized, that are meant to capitalize on the fact that people know what a button is and they interact with the button and they want a consistent experience because they've learned how to interact with that button over and over again. Um, and so we try to replicate and, and leverage the fact that people have learned behaviors and create that consistency in experiences when people go through workflows. Some of other examples, uh, there's this premise called change blindness um, and it, that lends itself to creating consistent experiences for users as well. Steven Anderson, uh, who is local as well, gave a great talk, gave a great talk a while ago about sweating the UX details. And in that, he had this great example of change blindness where he said, all right, if I don't attend to the change that happens within an experience, it's really difficult to see what changed. But if I speed up that change, it's much easier to see what goes away. And so when we create experiences, for example, if we're gonna be editing something, we try to create some continuity in, in, in the place that the user is on page. So you can see how that element stayed persistent. And that's really complex to achieve, so we end up having discussions with our dev partners on how to do that in a simpler way, and kind of maintain that consistency across an experience so people still know where they're at uh, within an experience. Um, lastly, the premise of change aversion as well within UX design, um, where when Google or Facebook launch a new experience, like they redo, the, they redo their Facebook news feed, everybody is gonna be upset because they have this learned behavior and they knew how to interact with it. And so what they try to do is they track over time whether or not that negative impact as a generation of that, as a result of that change will eventually net in a positive outcome for users. And this is the last one I promise, actually. In his book, Hook, Yuri Yao talks about how um, we are currently leveraging brain chemicals to create addicts out of product users. I know that that seems really strange, but you get a like on Facebook, and we know now that you do get, boom, a dopamine hit as a result of that. And so, also not to villainize them, but video games, just for example, are deliberately creating experiences that take advantage of our brain dopamine reward system. So that's 
thus me spending 24 hours uh, straight playing Zelda when I first got it on my Nintendo Switch and showing up to work the next day sleepy. So, in conclusion, thank you for bearing with me. Symmetry in nature is everywhere and it's efficient. In physics, it makes things unchanging and predictable. In music, it's harmonizing. In architecture, it's calming, it's detailed, and it represents precision. In film, it can be stylistic and intentional. In art, it's focus point, mathematical, and yawning. Uh, in writing, it's clarifying, it adds emphasis, and it's rhythmic. In product design, it can represent elegant simplicity, but can also cause things to be overly industrial. And in UX, it's consistent, it's learnable, it's comfortable, but it also can cause things to be missed, right? We create the same experience and we duplicate things over and over. People become, uh, they, they have blindness is associated with the flow. And damn, I really need something here to make this slide more <laughs> Now, uh, I look forward, hopefully you guys took something from this. Hopefully you were able to take something from the topic and uh, I look forward to you guys for the next three days going out and seeing symmetry in everything, either cursing me or... <laughs>